What's up amigos and welcome to the first uh, deck tech on the YouTube channel. So what we're going to be doing is we're just going to be talking about this sweet new deck in Historic. Um, we just had Amonkhet Remasters drop about oh, four days ago now, five days ago. And there's been kind of an arms race uh, to kind of figure out what's the best deck, what's the best field of the dead build. And I think uh, at the time of this recording, we actually have the best uh, field of the dead deck right now. I'll talk about as the reasons why in just a minute here but we're talking about some of the cards some of the stuff and talk about all that in this video so let's hop right into it so pretty standard stuff for the most part when it comes to our early plays we have explore and we have elvis rejuvenator so we're playing these cards just as a way to bridge towards our powerful uh late game threats which we all have nicely stacked up over here um they we just need cards in order to get extra lands this is pretty basic stuff when it comes to that the big a uh, thing that's missing from our deck though is we don't have the color blue. I think Uro is actually overrated in these sort of mirror matches of Field of the Dead. Uro is quite nice against some of the worst decks, but it's really not quite fast enough for this uh, mirror match, which I think is the best deck in Historic. It's also not good in some of the best decks against us, so it's kind of good against the weirder stuff that's happening in Historic. And with that being the case, I didn't really feel like I needed to play Uro. Uh, so I wanted to explore not playing Uro because I just had Uro and Grove Spiral and a couple cyborg cards and my mana was hurting me a little more and while it was very easy to turn on Field of the Dead, with a slight hit to the quality of lands we're playing, we take less damage and we don't have those kind of clunkier draws that can happen with having your, your mana not line up that is a real liability in a deck sort of like this where if you can consistently do your thing it's quite powerful. This deck is very good at doing that. So we play the Explorer Rejuvenators now. As for our four drops, we actually need something to kind of bridge us or as a way to catch up. So we play, actually need something to kind of bridge us or as a way to catch up. So we play two Settle the Wreckages and we play three Wrath of God, the new edition from Amonkhet. These are actually vital for our deck being able to hang in there. So the Soul Tide builds uh, play Extinction Event and the Vamp builds just play Wrath of God. And while I do think uh, Extinction Event is nice from the Soul Tide deck, Actually having access to sell the wreckage and having multiple different sweepers can be quite uh, impactful. And it is just, I think, important sometimes to be able to answer everything. Um, there's upsides to both Extinction and Exiling obviously matters a little bit, but I do think that just having the cleaner mana base and having a answer that does, you know, clear a whole board of things for the most part is very, very nice. It's surprisingly actually good in the mirror sometimes. You'll fall a bit behind and you need to actually just clear the zombies and like an Uro or something like that. And while the Uro might come back, and I don't think the Uro is great, it can, if go unchecked, take over the game. And so having something that can catch all those things can be sort of nice. And when you're playing with the Extinct, it can be kind of a liability and a little bit of a hassle. So it's nice to have that. It's also just great to have this kind of catch all cards when it comes to creatures on the board. For after we've gone to Field of the Dead, it's great to, you know, maybe play like an hour of Promise of Golos and then Wrath if they've kind of tried to put a, pressure, a bunch of pressure on board to pressure through your zombies and then you clean them all up and then get some more zombies. It's it's really punishing. This deck does a really good job of actually applying a lot of pressure on your opponent to win the game in a timely fashion. Uh, next we have Karn. This is kind of one of the bigger things that no other uh, Field of the Dead deck is doing right now. And I think this is a big uh, nod to us being a two color deck. So we are a green white deck. So we actually don't have uh, the same amount of cantripping that Uro and Growth Spiral provide. And so Karn actually is our way to get extra cards. And the trick that uh, I always like to think about with Karn is that with Karn, you really want to play it as long as you're okay with getting a a land off Karn, right? And and while you most of the time you'll want to find spells, obviously, sometimes you hit double spell, we have to wait a turn to get the spell. You kind of have the spell and suspend one, right? And Karn is like, hey, I have a lot of loyalty, I'm hard to kill, I'm just going to give you a bunch of lands most likely at the start. Luckily, our deck is really, really trying to make a five mana play on turn four, and a lot of the times you have either an Explorer or a Rejuvenator, and then you can play something like Karn on turn... Uh, three or two i'm sorry on turn three um in order to set up for a turn four play like that you know you can have like a turn two explore into a turn three car into a turn four hour or golos um and that can be a very powerful thing karn actually being colors as well as nice with our ugin as a thing that sticks around it's also nice to have the constructs um 
and some of the weirder matchups and stuff like that, you actually want to be able to pressure Planeswalkers. And some people have gone as far as to play like main deck Ashiok because it's like surprisingly good against us. Um, and there's some like graveyard decks running around. So being able to pressure those sort of, it's a nice, like weird sort of catch all kind of card. And honestly, Planeswalkers are a form of life gain. And if our opponent doesn't think they can kill us uh, in the time that it would take to kill Karn, Karn becomes, you know, draw a land, gain six life. and lord forbid they actually don't kill the Karn on the attack if you were to like attack Karn and get it low and i take it back up it's really back breaking Karn is a, a pivotal piece i think to this deck succeeding um you you just need that sort of thing and while you do sideboard it out a reasonable amount of the time you have some of these sort of cards that are flexible and do you know kind of like this i need raw cards thing and then when you're trying to find specific cards you kind of cut them kind of like think of it like an op sort of situation but much more powerful than opt all right under our game winning and also bridging spells which is part of the reason this deck is so messed up we have hour of promise and golos um, our promise is a new addition from Amon Ketlin. you have two lands giving field of the dead and another land or it's two different names it's very powerful and if you actually have three uh, deserts you get two 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 zombies which surprisingly comes up sometimes your opponent will have things like unmort ego or something like that and they will answer your field of the dead and being able to actually like have a desert in play ahead of time and then you know grab two more is kind of important um it also is just sometimes you randomly get that bonus our deck actually wants to play i think two of the deserts and then having hosh oasis as an untapped green source for uh field of the dead was sort of free and so sometimes you get it it's not huge but it's a part of the thing that matters this also just allowing you to have feel that trigger so much earlier and so much more consistently than something like golos where you can get to golos but when you play it doesn't maybe it doesn't like actually trigger your field of the dead our promise almost always when cast in this deck will trigger your field of the dead super powerful card also allows us to play a bunch of these next cards we're going to talk about that are super expensive but it's very important to remember that our hour promise and golos here are both game winning spells but they're also ways to bridge us towards things that like to bridge us towards things that like hard in the game and it's one of the real perks of this deck you know we get to play things like field of the dead grab a bunch of lands and then play these powerful spells that in the game are hard to interact with while our lands which are also hard to interact with typically in game one are there as well to uh, put pressure on an opponent and make them attack from a bunch of different angles. We play three Ugin. I skipped a card and come back in two seconds here. Ugin is a great trump in the mirrors. It's a great way to actually just invalidate anything your opponent did beforehand that involves the battlefield. If you're trying to play to the battlefield, Ugin probably beats you. And we have three of this because of how ramp heavy our deck is. So our deck has, you know, eight board clears if you count Ugins, maybe like six and a half if you want to get a little technical about it. Um, you know, maybe Ugin doesn't quite count as a board clear since it's eight mana, depending on where you come from. But either way, Ugin, an incredibly powerful card. Um, and a trump in these sort of mirror matches which are one of the most popular things on ladder on ladder right now you're going to run into a lot of the three of the following decks mirrors blue white aura of control decks and the control decks sometimes can actually establish pseudo soft locks and ugin normally invalidates those so normally that stuff kind of happens in the mirror more than game one but you get to play the ugins up front they're so powerful approach to the second sun this is a card that I, I've played a lot with some people recently. Um, I, I had a friend, uh, Bob and Cheese, as the they go by on MTGO, Nick, who was commentating the Hooglandia tournament this weekend. So he was trying to get some historic practice in and playing Soul Tide Field a lot. And I was playing Bant Field before this. And I approach the Second Sun really does this thing where it pressures your opponent from a completely different angle than the typical Field of the Dead does. So approach incredibly powerful card um winning the game on the second activation is great and the thing to kind of remember is a lot of times people's thought process with this um feel the dead deck is well the zombies will kill them give it enough time and that is true like if you elongate the game long enough you get the game long enough your opponent will most likely die to the zombies so people are very prepared for the zombies it's not like no one doesn't know about feel the dead it's not like we don't understand it's one of the three best decks if not the best deck in historic right now and people are coming prepared for it. And honestly, sometimes too, the zombies can become brick walled and your opponent can attack through you. So having something that doesn't interact in the typical way of the zombies is really, really hard for your opponents to interact with. And the seven life stabilizes you quite well. So for the second sun is great. We have all of our lands over here on screen. I could talk about them for a long time, not going to, but just know there's various different lands that can do various different things. You have like 
The Archer rests coast to draw a card. You have Blast Zone in order to answer multiple things. You have Field of Ruin for the Mirror. You have your Field of the Dead to win the game. You have Labyrinth, which is a surprisingly powerful card in the Boggles matchup, and that's how I got here. We have Radiant Fountain to help stabilize. We have Scavenging Grounds to be a Graveyard Hate card. You have all of these dual lands. Some Cycle, Some are Deserts. Chef of Dunes can buff our team. Hotshot Voices can buff us in order to kill Navy and Ashiok. There's a lot of little things going on here, and playing this deck, you'll kind of get a feel for them. But just sort of know that your land base is really tricked out. At this point in the video, I'm going to talk about the sideboard, but you should be seeing the sideboard guide pop up. So, with all of that in mind, let's see over here with our sideboard. So we have four Gideon's Triumph. A Gideon's Triumph was a card that uh, I found because I actually wanted to beat the Boggles matchup. Um, the the blue-white auras. I, I, I call it Boggles. Some people say that's dumb. I, I don't know what to call it. Leave a comment below and tell me what you would call that blue-white deck that plays Core Spirit Answer. You, you played all over ladder. It was maybe the best deck before this last set. But either way, Gideon's Triumph is a powerhouse card in that matchup. Just being an edict that makes you able to sacrifice and attacking creatures is huge. And you generally only need one. You'll take one or two big hits. They'll fly in for the last hit. And boom, you get Gideon's Triumph them. It's something that people can play around, but it can be kind of hard sometimes. Maybe you just wouldn't take that second big hit and you know wait for the third one, and then now, boom, you, you get them before they get a creature out. Or maybe they have like a selfless savior or something like that, and you can block and then you know trade that sort of thing off, not die, and they're trying to play on the Gideon's Triumph, and you know, now it's gone. It, it's also not targeting the creatures. It's super important. So Gideon's Triumph, you can bring it in other aggressive matchups if they have big singular creatures, but for the most part, it's really dedicated to the Boggles matchup. The Boggles matchup is one of our hardest matchups in Historic, and it's very, very good, and it deserves the four sideboard slots. Uh, we have three Rest in Peace. There's a lot of various graveyard decks. There's a lot of things going on. Even the Jun deck, which is kind of a mid rangey Bolas and Citadel combo deck, actually relies on the graveyard quite a bit uh, in some configurations. And so having access to such a haymaker like Rest in Peace is huge in those matchups. Rest in Peace. An all-star card if you've played modern that sort of thing the great thing about rest in peace is normally if it's good against the deck it's really really good exiling great it's really really good exiling graveyard into the battlefield making so they don't go there afterwards it is a all-star card and generally they have to bring in stuff to respect it and it's really hard for them to do that if you know you took turn two to rest in peace they like you know maybe you played some mediocre creature or starting to dig towards their answer you play rejuvenator they do something else you like play even like a Karn, then they answer the rest in peace all that time them not putting cards in their graveyard generally buys you a lot of time so rest in peace all-star card to have in the sideboard um you could try playing things like graph figures cage you have problem with the goblins matchup but i found goblins to be a matchup that while kind of variance heavy on which one of us goes off harder uh, we are able to normally clean up uh, we have two tithe takers tithe taker is kind of the weirder card in the sideboard and i would love to maybe find something a bit better but for right now there are some decks that you just kind of need to put a blocker in play and there are some decks where you need to put pressure on the board um and the tax effect normally full blue white that sort of thing as you see in our sideboard here we have a clean five in five out against control so tithe taker actually is kind of a a, a weak-ish but flexible card and against the control decks they generally try to do one of two plans they or they try to stick something like a blood sun or something like that and having tithe taker stops the ramp problem uh sorry stops the counter all your ramp cells problem normally because the extra additional mana is just so much for them while also being able to pressure their planeswalkers you know maybe their plan is to play a narset minus and then for the rest of the game counter your spells well if you have a tithe taker on that board that play is a lot less appealing and honestly not quite as doable you just can't afford to ever miss a land drop you can't ever develop something like an Escanta and hold of absorb that would be six mana to do that that's a lot of turns later it's very very hard even with a veto it's five mana it's a lot of mana and your spell has to line up right too talk about veto right like if you have golos you can be very pressuring on your opponent just gets to play on the veto for free so tie taker flexible the card we're definitely looking to always you know the sideboards are always being willing to adapt but it's not a card i'm married to it's not like gideon's triumph like gideon's triumph i think you have to have at least three to play the deck right now because of how good the boggle stack is play the deck right now because of how good the boggle stack is we have one more set of the wreckage in our sideboard this is a concession to creature decks um, and sometimes needing to exile specific creature decks. So I think this this sweeper can change up. It could be a planner cleansing if there are more planeswalkers. It could be another 
you know, answer to maybe like a Boggles deck if you wanted to be. For right now, I've settled on Settle as another like middle of the road goodish against Boggles, goodish against creature aggro decks, and you know, a, a card that sometimes you do get some bluff at. While bluffs are a little hard to sell in Arena, sell the wreckage. You one of the ones you can actually get away with so sometimes you just got some lands and your opponent attacks with two of three creatures and you take a little less damage and maybe you draw your actual wrath and then on the next turn you know you have a little bit more life where before you're still going to die in two turns but you have a little bit of an extra buffer to help stabilize the rest of the way we have the angel pairs of bane and lyra uh bane slayer and lyra dawnbringer two of the more powerful cards um in historic when it comes to five mana flyers they are quite good against the red decks. Generally, our plan is to turbo out one of these and then basically hope our opponent doesn't have fight with fires and that sort of stuff. That stuff hasn't caught on too much, and recently the way that my angels die is being double burn spelled. Typically, though, thanks to your approach and the general way we clog up the battlefield and how quick we are at doing our thing, I found that having the double burn spell happen on the angel normally tempos them out enough since we play our angels so quickly that they can't actually close the door and beat us. Also quite good against like the various green and little stompies that'll do those cards. And lastly, we have Ulamog, the Ceaseless Hunger. This is our go over the top control. Um, if your opponent's trying to play a lot of discard spells and stuff like that, and counter spells is a way to stop your approaches, we just simply put those approaches out of the game, you know, take them out and we bring in these Ulamogs and our game plan is, hey, the cast trigger is probably gonna beat you. And if it resolves, it's most likely gonna deck you. So Ulamog, super powerful card that's gonna do it for this deck tech is a little bit longer than we kind of would like but sometimes yeah, you gotta spend a little extra time um deck is great i highly suggest playing it if you're i, I would also say that uh you know feel the dead's probably going pretty soon it comes to the old dnr so uh if you're low on wild cards you have to craft a bunch of cards for this deck i can't in good faith tell you to uh unless you're okay with potentially losing on some value but for the most part almost every card in our deck i would say outside of tithe taker and gideon triumph which is an uncommon so that one doesn't really count in the old wild card case but tithe taker really is the on the old wild card case but tithe taker really is the quote unquote worst magic card and the biggest regret so that's the only one i would be a little afraid to lose some wild cards on but this deck is great right now everyone is trying to play these blue cards these euros that don't really matter too much in the mirror you just want to slam haymakers and take over the game that way i highly highly suggest playing this deck Thank you so much for watching and make sure to subscribe. That way you won't miss any more videos coming from this channel. We've got a lot of things coming up in the future. So till next time.